snails and anything, like I say, anything alive, we would take it and we would eat it. And the remark has been made that the only thing living at the time of our capture was us, because we had caught and eaten everything that we could possibly find. As I mentioned, the lack of food was a major factor from the time we landed on Bataan, and it was taking its toll each day, because the first day we got there, we were put on half ration, and there was not much choice. And we had no replacements. If we lost an airplane or tank, whatever, there was no replacement because they could not, the United States could not get them in there. Now artillery, anybody know what artillery is? Good, good. Artillery is the gun that fired the big projectiles. They might be anywhere from 3 inches to 12 inches. In our case, they fired them every four minutes for many days in a row, 24 hours a day. That was a plan to tire us out. We were tired already. But imagine that. We needed that sleep very badly. <clears throat> Now, I believe it was Eleanor Roosevelt, and I'm sure some of you read something about Eleanor Roosevelt, and perhaps others, who said, war is hell. I can say that too. But having been on the losing side in a war, Ernest Hemingway's words said it a little better. He said, I've seen a lot of war and the only thing I've ever seen that is worse than war is losing a war. I can vouch for that also. <coughs> now, due to the lack of food and sickness, we were forced to surrender on the 9th of April of 1942, or we'd all be killed because we are done fighting. We, could, we were done. We were exhausted. We could not fight anymore. And this had to be the most horrible part of my life. When you have to throw away your pistol and your rifle. And at that moment, you have lost your freedom. And I pray to God that none of you ever lose your freedom. And I can't tell you what it is. Now we were lined up in fours, and the baton death march begins. I think some of you heard that, you said you did. <clears throat> we will lose thousands of men on this march in the next week or ten days. As we walk along, after the first day or so, we could see more bodies that had fell. They got sick, some of them died where they were. And if they weren't dead, I guess that's a good word to use, the Japanese would either shoot you, bayonet you, or decapitate you, one of the three. And that was kind of hard at first, but you believe it or not, you get kind of used to it. And it's just terrible to see these men that just couldn't walk and they were alive and they were killed for not being able to walk. I have to mention one thing that's a little bit gory. When the Japanese decapitated you, of course, most of these men were on the ground, but sometimes they'd have you stand up and you'd bow. You had to bow to every Japanese a word as a way of saluting them. And they would decapitate you from behind and on the neck. But, we see in one case, for some reason or other, Jack got behind the guy, and he hit him this way with his sword. And it went right down to his jaw, and to his neck here somewhere. But you could see that head split open. 
See what I mean when I say a war is hell? You can't imagine it. Now this column that we started out was about 17 miles long and included 12,000 Americans and 60,000 Filipinos. And the march would be from 50 to 70 miles in hot, 100 degree, humid weather. Most of us had no caps by that time. And we were in the sun all day long. Now we were warned not to carry any weapon of any kind on our body. If they found that we had, they were shot. No questions asked. About the second day when we were marching, one of the Japanese callers out, 20 men, they pick out 20 men and they pull them over to the side. And through an interpreter, they say, remove all of your clothing. You better do it. But we had one man that was reluctant to take off his trousers. So they pulled him out here about 10 feet from the rest of us where we could all see it. And of course they pointed a rifle right at his head and said, remove your trousers. And he did. He had to or he'd been shot right on the spot. And sure enough, between his knee and his thigh, he had a pistol strapped to his left leg. And the Japanese were really enjoying that because they knew they were going to do something really to them sort of real. So the one strong Japanese guard, I thought he looked like the strongest guy of the bunch, five or six of them, he grabbed his rifle by the barrel, which I thought was kind of stupid because I didn't do that with a barrel pointing at me. But that's the way he did it. And he swung it as hard as he could swing it and he hit the spot where that pistol was strapped to his leg and, of course, broke it. Now, I'm just saying that man maybe didn't live more than two days because we had no way of helping anyone. We had no medical care whatsoever. Nil. And then we noticed, <coughs> excuse me, we noticed something that we want along that the Japanese were not taking wedding bands off any of us. Thank God I was not married at the time, but those that were, of course, had their wedding bands on. And we couldn't figure out why in the world aren't those Japanese taking those wedding bands. They were taking everything else, every other thing. It didn't take us long to get on to the fact that if we took this ring and turned it upside down, all of a sudden we had a wedding man. Most of us got by with it, but one guy, the Japanese senior monkey with his finger, I guess, he went over to the guy, grabbed his hand and pulled him out a little ways, and he couldn't get the ring off the guy. The Japanese soldier, he pulled and he pulled and he pulled and he couldn't get it off. So remember I mentioned the bayonet a little while back. So another soldier, he's going to take his bayonet and the other guy is going to hold it like this and they're going to try and cut that finger off with a bayonet. But I don't even think the Japanese soldiers do it. But the bayonet is only sharpened about three inches from the point. And here he was trying to saw it off with the basic part of the bayonet blade. And of course it never came off. So he finally gave up. And then the guy that was holding the finger, he gave up too, of course, and they gave it one vicious yank, and I think it came out about two inches. And you could see the cords that are normally behind your knuckles, they were in front of your knuckles. White as snow. So war, I keep saying, war is hell, folks. And we noticed one Japanese officer riding along. And he walked, he walked along on his horse, and he's got his sword sticking out as far as he can reach it. And he comes along where we're walking, and he tried to hit us all in the neck. 
when he's driving along. And he did catch quite a few. He didn't get to the point where he decapitated them, but there was a lot of that were hurt, and I'm sure died from lack of blood when he did get here. <clears throat> I have to mention a little thing about vitamins before I forget it. Your lips were cracked all the time after the first year or so, and your joint in your fingers were all open, and it hurt. A little weird story now. Where we were staying, we were in a compound, so to speak, maybe 300 acres, high barbed wire fences on it, two layers of it, guards walking it, Japanese guards walking it 24 hours a day, and one night, a Filipino somehow crept up behind this Japanese guard and with his bow knife, excuse me a minute, <clears throat> this is a bow knife. This is what the Filipinos carry, but not for killing people. They harvest their rice and they chop the drum and they do all kinds of things with this. But in any case, this Filipino beheaded that one Japanese guard. And the next day, ten Japanese walked out of the compound, out of the prison area, all carrying swords. And I'm estimating that two hours later, they all came back, their swords like this on their shoulder. I can show you. Excuse me. <clears throat> they came back with their swords in this position. the end of each sword was a Filipino's head. Ooh. Only his head. And it's pretty easy to remember. They had the tip of it stuck in the guy's mouth with some wooden slider all over the sword, I guess. But they had taken ten Filipinos for that one Japanese. We were happy as could be. And we said, we were pleased that one of those bastards were killed. And we were. But look how dearly the Filipinos paid for it. Now we'd done some things that were comical in a way too. We'd done some things that were helping, helping the war effort. For instance, <clears throat> One of our buddies, one of my buddies, I knew him, he happened to know for the Japanese guard, all of the guard, kept their rice stored. And he sits talking to us one night, and I haven't got the <clears throat> dysentery part of it yet, folks. But everybody had dysentery, and I think most of you know what that is, like diarrhea. And this buddy of mine, he collected a tin can full of this residue. Is that a good word? Residue? If you're with me, I know you are. And under the cover of darkness, he went across that road, and he took that little can of his, and he poured a few drops in all these sacks of rice that were sitting there. We knew where they were. And he said that he even went into them and mixed them up so the Japanese wouldn't see it on the top when they opened the sacks. And of course, in them days, everything was outside Biffy, including the Japanese. So two days later, we were still watching. Then it started. <laughs> we accomplished our mission. They were running back and forth to that Biffy like you wouldn't believe it. Some of them kind of hurry like <clears throat> But we thought that was pretty nice. We, we felt pretty smart. In July of 